Hi, I'm your host, Dee Dee Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Acoustics with Jay Fergoletto. This multi-part series is an overview of acoustic topics. For a more in-depth look, we highly recommend Jay Fergoletto's book and courses. Jay is an award-winning veteran mastering engineer who has owned high-end mastering studios in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Boston. His clients have included Alice in Chains, Annie DeFranco, Oasis, India Ari, Black Eyed Peas, Blondie, In Excess, and many more. Albums that Jay has mastered have earned a Grammy Award, as well as gold and multi-platinum record awards. He is an accomplished pianist and multi-instrumentalist. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. Hi, it's Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders uh, TV, and uh, we're talking about acoustics. We're continuing our discussion, our series of talks on the subject. Um, so we're talking about large rooms right now. We're talking about things like concert halls, recital halls, performance spaces, things that are very large. Um, we're not talking about control rooms. We're not even talking about recording spaces in most recording studios, unless it's a scoring stage. Um, so no discussion of large room acoustics is going to be complete without the father of large room acoustics, uh, the person who first started the, the study of, um, of this and figured out the, the sort of the famous equation about how to figure out reverb time and things like that. Um, and this, of course, is the story of Wallace Clement Sabine and Boston Symphony Hall. So this really was the first hall that was designed with actual scientific prediction of what the performance and the reverb time would be. So um, a lot of architects back then and still now uh, are wonderful at, at things that are going to be new and unique and interesting to look at. And they don't necessarily ignore considerations for sound, but uh, sound is usually subservient to other things. Uh, there's other things just about the, um, you know, the way the space is going to be used and how the space is going to look and uh, things like that. Uh, and sound sort of comes second. And again, architects know a little bit about it, but they're not acousticians, so they don't know a whole bunch about sound. Um, so imagine, you know, back in the late 1800s, uh, before the turn of the century, they really didn't know anything about sound back then. So, late 1800s, owner of Boston Symphony Orchestra at that time is uh, Henry Lee Higginson. And uh, it's time to grow into a new space. Uh, and so he's got to find a new home for the orchestra and um, looking for a new space and uh, gets this prestigious New York architectural firm uh, called uh, McKim, Mead, and White. And, um, they start sort of doing some initial sketches, and they do one that kind of looks like a Greek theater with these, you know, sort of that half circle that's steeply raked uh, seats. Um, so he starts handing this sort of around, uh, asking directors, musicians, listeners, things like that, what they think. And people sort of instantly look at that and go, uh, this doesn't look like the wonderful European halls that we're used to. Um, there's um, things like the uh, Gewandhaus in uh, Leipzig, Germany. Uh, which was definitely the best regarded European hall at the time, which unfortunately got destroyed in World War II. But um, these and other really highly re regarded spaces are designed as shoebox, shoebox halls. They look rectangular like a box that holds shoes. Um, so at this point, he starts to think, well, nobody seems to think this Greek theater look is the right thing. All the best sounding rooms are shoebox. Let's, let's go with that. Um, he also um, happens to be talking to Harvard University President Charles Elliott at the time, who says, hey, I've got this young professor um, who um, did all of this work studying uh, all, all of our lecture halls here and um, did a renovation of Fog Art Museum and uh, helped uh, you know, get some of the acoustics there. And he, he's got all this data and has figured some stuff out. Why don't you talk to him? So um, he says, great, great idea. Um, so Sabine had studied. Um, all of these rooms, uh, and it was it was a great scene. I can imagine this. He had all of his uh, students helping him, and they would go into the theater, steal all the cushions, 
run over to the other space at night when after you know the classes are done and the spaces aren't being used and he would like put up all of these cushions and start you know making impulses and measuring how long it took to decay and then taking less cushions and measuring and doing this in different rooms and he just got this massive amount of data took a couple of weeks to distill it all down and came out with the now famous Sabian equation uh, that we talked about, RT60 or T60, the reverb time, um, 0.049 V room volume over A total absorption. Uh, so he figured out this equation for that. Um, so um, the architects don't know yet that Higginson has been talking to this young physics professor who's got some ideas about acoustics. So um, finally, he's kind of convinced, yeah, yeah, we want to use this new scientific, these ideas, these equations. Great, I'm convinced. Uh, sends him to New York to meet with the architects, and they were not terribly excited to meet him. <laughs> so after a couple of hours there, um, so the architect basically storms out and says, you know what, I'm not taking any responsibility for the way the sound of the room is just, it's all on him, forget it. You want me to do his stupid thing? We'll do that and I'll just, you know, I'll make the place look pretty. Um, of course, luckily some of his making it look pretty uh, and other things were just sort of luck where he had these beautiful little sort of areas of uh, statues and the coffered ceiling and all of these sort of things that were ornate and beautiful which happened to contribute to a wonderful diffuse sound uh, and also for fire um, resistance they had to use these uh, this big concrete and plaster stuff that wouldn't burn, which again, very massive, contains all of that energy, really helps the base um, be contained in the room and makes the, the, the sound of that room be very strong and full rather than kind of wimpy because all the base got out. Um, so again, some of the things just by luck of the draw happen. Uh, other things that were sort of luck of the draw happened with um, well, how wide do we want the hall? How deep do we want it? Well, we don't want it to be super narrow. We want to, you know, they did a little bit of kind of like, hey, let's copy some of the great halls, in, you know, in Europe. And then, oh, we don't want it to be too wide. We want uh, sight lines. We, you know, we don't want anybody to be too far away. We want them to be able to see. And a lot of these things um, sort of uh, have contributed to a good sound, having there not be um, too much of, of a gap between the initial sound and the onset of the reflections, what's called the ITD, or initial time delay gap. So things that now we understand are really important for wonderful sounding music reproduction uh, in a hall, which then, some of it they predicted, some of it they just lucked out, and uh, of course we listened to these halls now and have learned, holy moly, these are the good halls, why is that? Uh, so the study continued and we figured this out. but. Um, at the time, this was brand new, to be able to actually predict how a room was going to sound and try to aim for, okay, hey, the, um, the, the reverb time uh, in the mid frequency is you know, around 1.9 or, or you know, 2, something like that, just under 2 seconds. Uh, that's the, the, the sort of the thing that in, in the best halls everyone likes. Let's try to actually predict that and, and make that happen in our new space and then to actually have that be successful. This was revolutionary right around, um, you know, turn of that century. So Symphony Hall opened its doors on October 5th, 1900, and um, everybody loved the sound right away. So, so important is it to sort of keep everything as it was that in 2006, um, the concert stage floor really needed replacement. I mean, hey, it's a century old, it's worn out. So they spent $250,000 uh, ensuring the use of original methods and materials. So hard maple and compressed, wood un, uh, w compressed wool underlayment, uh, the hand hammered hardened steel cut nails, even the back channeling of the original boards, they replicated everything to make sure that the acoustics stayed the same. Um, the original vertical grain fur subfloor actually was in great shape, so they just left that in place. Uh, but nobody wanted to be the, hey, let's use these modern materials and ways and change it and then have the sound of, you know, what's ba considered the best or second best hall in the entire world by pretty much everybody. You don't want to mess with that. Um, so anyway, that is the story of Wallace Clement Sabine and Symphony Hall and the very first room where they use scientific prediction to uh, actually predict what that hall was going to sound like, aim for uh, a particular characteristic, and nail it. 
Um, so I'm Jay Frigletto for Audio Boomers TV, and we'll catch you next time.